I would give a laundry list of accolades, inspiring stories, examples, and quotes from his life as part of his introduction. But as I do my research and listen to my subjects, he doesn't like to label himself or be put in a box by worldly standards. So I'll just let him tell you about his life himself. So buckle up or don't. Welcome to the Scandals Podcast. John Joseph, singer of the Thermax. And as you'll find out so much more, how are you doing? Former singer of the Cro-Mags, watch out, you'll get the lawsuits <laughs> getting your way. The have... original, I'm going to say this, the original singer of the Cro-Mags and the best singer of the Cro-Mags. <laughs> and that's that's not ego, that's the truth. <laughs> so, whatever. <laughs> All right. You were, you were the one I chose. There was an option and I could have gone either yeah, way. I chose yeah, no, you. Fucking whatever. Yeah. You know, everybody could say whatever they want on social media now. It's a shit show, but the truth is the truth, you know? So, yeah. Glad to be here. Hope you, how, how you doing? <laughs> I'm happy. Um, I'm excited about the interview. You, um, you've had a hell of a life so far. So it was fun for me to write. So I'm excited about the right, podcast. Right, ready to right. start on it. Still, yeah. still, still out here, uh, you know, in this new paradigm of the world, fucking, you know, doing my thing. So it's it it's remaining interesting, so to speak. <laughs> You've definitely kept busy for sure. You don't do one thing; you do everything. Nope multitasking Every, i just finished another book i just put out another album i'm training for another iron man and just uh you know yeah nah, getting a one-man show together live spoken word thing so uh you know yeah just keep busy that's it stay positive meditate eat right hold the whole uh you know kit and caboodle so to speak well that's uh and that's a perfect intro so i love it i said i wouldn't list accolades but i just got back from metallica a few days ago and james hatfield and lemmy used to come to your shows and watch you play how does your head ever shrink back down to normal size after that and go on to I mean, write such care. beautiful books and stuff like yeah. that yeah well i don't i never got involved with all the ego shit of music you know that's what destroyed the crow mags you know, we started out sleeping on people's floors, traveling in broke down vans. We were a team and uh, everybody fucking stayed humble. And, you know, we just did it for the love of the music. And then when the success started to come, certain individuals fucking heads couldn't even fit through the door anymore. So I don't do music out of ego. I do it because I love to play music. Um, and to me, James Headfield and all these guys, it was right after Cliff Burton died, so uh, you know they James Hetfield came to our show at uh, at Lemoore, and I'm playing, and somebody goes, "Oh, can James Hetfield's in the fucking mosh pit?" You know, and and he was rocking a Crow Mag hat later, and you know, but I mean, those guys love punk rock, you know, you know, the Misfits never really blew up until Metallica started fucking wearing their shit, especially Cliff Burton, you know was a big time Misfits fan. I mean, I remember being at Misfits shows where there was fucking 20 people there. So it was other bands putting other bands on. And and and, and I love that about Metallica was that even to this day, they, they, they always look out for other bands that, you know, and the Misfits do it too now. If you look at, you know, their big concerts that they're playing, man, fucking, they always hook up the punk bands, the, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great thing, but, you know, life is life and, um, you know, people change and, uh, and that's what's up. But like, you know, music to me is just an expression. So this, it doesn't have to be this like, you know, you get that whole rock star attitude shit, and I just don't give a fuck about that. Like, you know, I just uh, keep it real, man. That's it, you know? I love it. Love those stories right off the bat. Well, it is time for us to go back to square one. You've had one of the hardest childhoods that I think I've ever heard of when researching it. And I won't shy away from talking about the hard things because it's an example to others that on the other end of turmoil and deep pain is peace and ascension. 
and you can live another way as your life can be so much more than what it is currently. You've worked your ass off at that harder than anyone I've seen from what I can tell. If you could go back and maybe like pay it forward or communicate to people like one thing they could possibly do better or different or help, you know, list or name one thing that maybe could change or be better about the foster care system. What do you think it should be? I mean, foster care system's a shit show. Um, obviously, there's too many kids in there and there's too many fucked up people that are taking kids for the wrong reasons. I fell into that whole situation. But, you know, I'm, it, it, it is what it is. And, and what I what I always tell people is, it's, you know, it's always the darkest before the dawn, no matter what anybody's going through. And I've been through it all. Addiction, homelessness, abuse, you, you, you know, lock up, you fucking name it, man. Um, but I never gave up, you know. Um, and I just kept trying to better myself. And I've had, you know, and it's been these periods of like, I fell back into addiction in, in 88 for two years, but I just, I just, I just kept fighting, I, you know, and that, that's what it takes. You have to have that fighter's mentality, that fighter's mindset that, you know, um, you may be going through anything now, but you can't, you can't quit, you know, you, you got to keep pushing through. And, uh, I just lost my brother, uh, last October to addiction after like over 20 years of insanity. And I mean, it was, you know, and I'm writing a book, excuse me, on addiction and he passes away during the writing of the book from addiction. So, you know, I, I really saw the value in the message of this book. And, you know, the first part is just, telling all the stories of our family and how it was destroyed by addiction. The whole shit started with my father's addiction, drinking and drugging. Everything that, you know, and then even researching the book, I, I, I met a long lost relative, uh, my cousin. Um, my, my father was the black sheep of the family. The rest, Everybody else on his side of the family, the McGowans, the firefighters, police, all this, you know, just upstanding uh, people, and he was the criminal. And my cousin's father was his brother, and she told me that when my, when my father and the kids were old enough to reach up to the bar, they were served hard liquor, because that's, their parents were from Ireland. That's what, that's what they do. And, um, that whole side of the family too had my grandfather on that side died at 50 years old, cirrhosis of the liver. Like, you, you know, just finding out all this stuff, researching this book, you see the devastating toll that addiction takes, uh, on a family. And then the kids have to suffer. And I, I did a lot of research in the book too, statistically. And, you know, um, the National Institute of Health said that uh, over 85% of kids who were abused as children, by the time they're 18, develop a substance abuse problem. So there's a lot of, you know, being out there all these years and talking and then, then social media and having people message me and all this shit. It's a lot of people going through shit that, dealt with similar stuff to what we had to deal with. And, you know, my brother couldn't get past the, the pain of all that. And he dealt with it by destroying himself. And I say this, if you do that, then the ones who did the shit win, right? They won. If you destroy yourself and fuck your life up, then the motherfuckers that did all the shit to you as kids, they win. And I got to tell you something else. I went back to that foster home after... I went to do a reading in Long Island, like a town away from where those foster parents were. And I went with uh, my friend, Stephanie Swain. She worked for Simon & Schuster and, you know, she helped me with the book design, everything. And uh, so I, I did a reading at a, at a record store 
like one town away. And I said, I got it. I've never been back to this house. I have to see if I have to see the house. It's in, it's in the next town. She's like, are you sure? And, and I went there and, um, you know, we pulled up and, and uh, this old man was watering the lawn across the way. And I'm like, I fucking remembered the dude. Like he was like, you know, you know, you're talking back in the 70s now. So this is like, I don't know when that book came out, I guess. This was many, many decades later. And uh, and I said, hey, who lives in that house? And he was like, I was like, it, is it is it still, you know, the Valentis and and. He was like, yeah, you know, he was from Italy. He goes, yeah, it's a rose and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I said, I, I was one of the foster kids in that home. And I'm the one that got that home shut down. And his eyes got like two saucers. And he dropped the hose, never said a word, and just ran off and went into his house and didn't come back out. Because I think they knew that one day... We were going to show the fuck back up. And I went and knocked on that door. And basically my message to her was, you didn't fucking win. You didn't fucking win. You tried to destroy us. You tried to take every ounce of fucking dignity that we had. And, we, and you didn't win. And that's what I had to say to her. And... I fucking turned and walked away and I went and did, it was at Looney Tunes and I, in Long Island, record store, bookstore, and I did the best reading, the funniest reading I ever did out of any of the book readings that I did when the memoir came out. And, um, you know, and that's what it's all about. If we give in to the addiction, then the people that fucked us over it's another victory for them. They destroyed our lives. They took out they took our innocence as children. You know, we trusted them. We trusted them to take care of us. And they were monsters. And everybody in that home was a fucking monster. And, you know, I did that um Iron Mind, the movie thing, and the guy asked me. What would you do to the people that molested you if you ever seen them? And I said, I can't answer that question. I can't answer that question. I don't know what I would do. I know what I would have done 20 years ago. I'd be in prison for fucking double homicide. But cross that bridge if, it, if I ever get to it. I will confront them, but... uh. You know, and I'll tell you something. In, interesting, interestingly enough, it's it it's cyclical addiction, and it runs in the families. I don't believe it's genetic. I just believe that you can be predisposed to it by the circumstances that you put into. Speaking of which, that's what we saw around us, and. My brother had strokes and comas and fucking, you, you name it. I, I mean, it, it's just been crazy, uh, the amount of shit that he survived in his addiction. And they had, gave him Mercer in the VA. They put him on Oxycontins and all this shit. And um, so he had to get another surgery, but he was addicted to pills and drinking, so... With his heart being what it was, they had to uh, put him in a medically induced coma and detox him before they could do the surgery. So he went up to the Finger Lakes um, VA hospital. And the nurse comes in the first morning, you know, picks up his chart. Oh, Frank McGowan, are you any relation to John McGowan? And... Um, he says, yeah, that's my brother from the Cro-Mags, you know. And she goes, no, not John McGowan, John Emil, John Joseph McGowan, he said. And she said, no, John Emil McGowan. And my brother was like, that's my father. Like, why are you bringing that up? And she says, John Emil McGowan is your father? And Frank says, yeah, that's my father. I ain't never seen him since we were kids. 
She goes, I'll be right back. She comes back five minutes later and says, what's your mother's maiden name? You have two brothers, right? Yeah, Eugene and John. And the nurse says, your father's dying in the room next to you. Wow. And... I mean, you can't even make that shit up. We didn't even know that that motherfucker was in the military. None of that shit. And um, he called me from the hospital and told me that shit after it happened. And basically, he wanted to send in, when he found out, he wanted, he was dying. And, and he tried to send in a priest to ask for forgiveness and all this shit. My brother said, fuck him. Tell him to fucking burn in hell for everything he did to my mother. And um, that was that, and he he passed away. So when Frank got out, they gave him a paper bag of all my father's remains. Nobody claimed his ashes. When he what was in that paper bag was a filthy pair of sneakers, a filthy pair of pants, a filthy T-shirt, and a half a pack of Camel non filters. He died alone. He died homeless. And I said to Frank. What are the odds that your father that abandoned you and did every single fucking thing that you did, that you've done in your life, you repeated what he did, is dying in the same room next to you? You couldn't fucking write that in a movie and anybody would believe it. And I said, that was God, that was the universe, that was whoever holding up a mirror to you saying, this is where you're headed. And that's exactly, I mean, his wife died in his arms of an overdose. He had a meltdown. I had to do, my first intervention on him was in, in 2001, September 10th. I had to go to Staten Island and he was in somebody's fucking attic dying. I fucking dragged him on the ferry back to New York City, made, made an appointment uh, the next day, he was going to fly down to St. Thomas to a rehab that our friends uh, ran. And what happened September 11th, 2001? The fucking 9-11. I couldn't, he couldn't get out. He detoxed in my couch, going through all this shit, that crying and, and just everything we went through as kids. It all came out. When I couldn't get him to fly, I couldn't get him down there for three weeks. And I said, Frank, you did the same shit. Even after his wife died in his arms of an overdose, I, I had to fucking get him in Jersey and take him to the VA uh, on 23rd and 1st. He fucking left the next day. And he went right back to the house where she died. And I said, you're, you're doing the same shit our father did. You abandoned your fucking children. You're a fucking violent alcoholic. The whole shit. The whole shit. You did the you did the same exact thing and you're gonna die. And he died alone. Sadly, he died alone. And you know, just thinking of what he went through at those last moments of his life, the fear of calling out for somebody to help him, and he had a massive heart attack. But, you know, it is, it is, uh, it is, it is what it is. I mean, you know, when you had already bad health and then you took something else that ain't fucking healthy for you, uh, that, that was the fucking, that was it, man. That was, that was, that was the, the end of his ride. And every day I write, every day I wrote, that's my brother. I keep his picture right here. And my brother would give you the shirt off his fucking back. My brother helped so many people, but he couldn't turn that same help to himself. He couldn't show that same compassion to himself and fight that disease because it is a disease. So that's, you know, the the book uh, has a lot of deep meaning for me because I, I, I lived it. And the craziness and all the crazy situations, I was a violent drug addict. I, I wasn't one of these like, you know, begging for fucking change on the sidewalk. I was still banging out three, four hundred push-ups a fucking day and going to rob drug dealers in Alphabet City and the Lower East Side to get my shit. I had people put KOSs on me, kill on sight. They were like, we're going to kill that surfer-looking motherfucker when we catch him. 
So that was my whole experience, the, like the book that I wrote and the experiences that I went through and the insanity of this lifetime was all a result of, it started the inciting incident of my whole journey, just like they say, writing a story has five parts of story design, inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, resolution. The inciting incident in my story is my father's drug and alcohol use and the night that he broke in and fucking beat my mom down so bad he almost killed her and then it was they fucking she spun into depression and they they took us away so you know and it's just been fighting through all of that shit and then finding punk rock in the 70s and the ramones and the sex pistols and the damned and all this shit and 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 how that message resonated with me Fuck the system. The system fucked me over. The system, the child care system, you will you will talk about foster care. They failed us. No fucking social workers came. Nobody did check and balances. If they came, they said, hey, we're coming every three, four months. And they let you know, they let them know, I'll be there next Thursday. Well, for that whole week, they put the fear of God into us and beat the shit out of us that if we said anything, we were going to be fucking input in a fucking mental institution or whatever. The shit that, the shit that we had to go through. So that's why I took my chances and I got locked up. I did almost two years of 21 months upstate, three in Spofford, 20, like 20 months upstate, almost just short of two years, went out onto the street, caught another case. I'm, I was a drug addict when I went into the Navy. So all the people that are like, yeah, he fucking went AWOL. I was, I was, I caught a drug case in Norfolk, Virginia. I was, I had a drug business in the Navy. I was smuggling in the Navy and I had a drug business and they caught me and I was facing federal time. I'm a kid that's been locked up my whole life. I said, no, I'm not going back to prison and I split. But I turned my life around from that point, meeting the bad brains, 1980 and all that shit. I got off the drugs. I got off all that shit. I turned my life around. I went and lived. I was the first person to live as a monk in the in in the hardcore scene or punk scene. I did. I spent two years in a temple. No. So trying to better myself and deal with these fucking demons that I had in my entire life. So anybody could criticize. It's like they say. Talk shit when you walk the mile in somebody's shoes until they shut your fucking mouth because you don't know what people go through. I, I've been feeding the homeless. I set up the homeless uh, food program at Tompkins Square Park in 1982. And then I continued on. I've done benefits for the homeless. I fed the homeless. I've been out on the fucking line. And there was one guy, and I wrote about it in the PMA effect. I met this guy, and, you know, he would just show up and get the food and then, you know, go sit down and, Nobody ever talked to him. He never said anything, this white guy. And I'm like, there's something to this motherfucker. Like, and I always question, because I know why I ended up homeless. I know why I ended up on the streets. And, you know, people talk about street justice and all this shit, survival of the streets. I didn't have mommy to go home to two blocks away from the squat. I didn't have a plan B. I was the streets. Okay, I lived that shit on the streets. And, you know, the whole thing is like, it's just, you know, you look at, you you, you just look at everything and, and, and people are so quick to judge people that do drugs or whatever. And I sat and talked with this guy. And at first he wouldn't say anything. But I always wanted to know how the fuck did, did somebody end up in that situation? Right? Because it's compassion. It's understanding. It's not judging anybody. And after sitting in with him for a couple of times, and, and he would help, like, if it rained, he would, he would help. Because we served out snow, rain, whatever the fuck. He would, we, we, we would hang like a tarp, a tent, and he would help, you know, whatever. So after I, I sat with him and I go, hey, man, how'd you end up on the streets? And he got real fucking quiet. And he just sat there. And then he said, 
I used to make high six figures on Wall Street. I had the condo. I had the summer home. We had the vacations. I had kids. I had a wife. My wife and kids were killed by a drunk driver. So I started drinking to deal with the loss of everything. I started doing drugs. I stopped going to work. I couldn't pay my rent. I got evicted. I ended up sleeping under the East River overpass. Not giving a fuck about nothing. And then he said one day he walked up and he was going to jump off the Manhattan Bridge. And his kids came to him and said, don't do it. And that was it. That was the change. He went into rehab and then I didn't see him for a while. So I was like, what the fuck happened to this dude? And he came back in a fucking suit and tie and helped us serve out and told me what happened. That he was going to kill himself. He built his life back up. Got a job, stopped getting high, went to rehab, did all that stuff. So that's what I said. When people want to judge my brother or anybody that's you know, even Todd Youth that was in blood clot. So before you judge somebody, walk a mile in their motherfucking shoes. And I'm just going to end with that. Because I've been out on the front lines. I fed KRS-One. KRS-One talks about being fed by the Hare Krishnas in the shelter on 3rd Street. I was the one that said, hey, let's go distribute the rest of the food from Tompkins Square Park at the men's shelter. I'm the one that fed KRS-One when he was a homeless fucking kid in the shelter. They called him Harry Krishna Chris. Go watch his video about how he got his name. That's what he said. The Harry Krishnas used to come and give me the vegetarian food and then I read the Swami's books. I've been out there doing this for fucking decades. Meeting with these people never felt, oh, I'm some rock star. No, I'm I'm on the fucking level of anybody. Everybody's one paycheck or one bad event in their life happening that will fucking put them out on the street. And now with all this shit going on with this chaos and this government and taking people's rights and everything, people are going to start fucking snapping and losing their shit. So don't judge anybody because you don't know what a motherfucker's been through. And I always said that too on the streets. You mind your P's and Q's in New York City because I knew motherfuckers that wouldn't say nothing, but if you fucked with them, they would take your life in a second. That's who I grew up with. That's who I, I grew up with maniacs in the 70s, murderers. So... All of that shit came as a result of the drugs. That's why I, I don't even take a sip of fucking alcohol on New Year's Eve now. Nothing. No drugs. No alcohol. Eat right. Meditate. My mind's right. I study. I do research. I re I got six. I just wrote my sixth book. I research everything I talk about. I don't just put speculation out there. And it's the same shit with my views now. I don't need some obese motherfucker eating McDonald's telling me what I got to do to protect his health. Fuck you. Go to the gym and stop eating shit. 85% of all the deaths of COVID was the obese with three or more pre-existing conditions. And you're going to tell me how to live my life? No, you're not. I put in the fucking work. I've been out on the fucking streets. And now I chose to turn my life around. Anybody can do it. It takes... Discipline. That's why I coach in discipline. Discipline creates the habits. The habits create the routines. The routines are who we are. Not who the fuck we say we are on fucking social media. All bullshit. Everybody puts this big facade. Tough punk rock hardcore. 
Then the real time comes for you to be punk rock hardcore and you fold like fucking cheap Kmart suits and criticize everybody that stayed punk rock. I never voted for a politician in my motherfucking life. I criticized every one of them for what they did. Bush, fucking Clinton, Trump, Obama, and now this fuckface in the White House. And I will continue to do it because that's what the fuck the shit was about when I got into it. And I lived the shit. When I heard Bad Brains, Fearless Vampire Killers, the bourgeoisie said, better watch out for me. All throughout the so-called nation, we don't need your filthy money. We don't want your innocent bloodshed. We just want to end your world. That blew me the fuck away. When I heard about PMA, attitude, I was like, what the fuck is that? It's not what happens to somebody. It's what they do as a result of it. That's the fucking, that's what makes a person. True character, just like my writing teacher said, is only revealed under pressure. The greater the pressure, the greater the revelation of true character. It's only when we're tested in life do we find out who the fuck we are. Everybody wears a mask in public that they want everybody to believe their characterization. Oh, I got tattoos. I'm, I'm tough. I sing in a hardcore band. And then the pressure comes and what happens? So I don't, I don't buy any of that bullshit. I, I look for people that are real and true and honest and caring and compassionate. Those are the fucking rock stars. Not some asshole that sings in a band that thinks he's fucking God's gift to the fucking humanity. Fuck all of those people. And, you know, I, I've stayed true to the tenets of hardcore and punk since I've been a kid. I never fucking changed. My knowledge grew. That was the change. I saw how despicable the fucking government and these corporations are. How evil they are. Despicable fucking people. And the scene turned against the ones who spoke up to side with them. That is fucking mind-blowing. And I don't give a fuck. Anybody, do you come at me in your little chat rooms and all your bullshit? I walk with my motherfucking head up on the sidewalk. Nobody says shit to me in person. Because I don't give a fuck. And it's about staying true to the shit. And I've been living it. Living the lyrics that I wrote. Hard times. Are coming your way. And here they are. You're going to have to rise above us someday. Organize your life and figure it out. Or you'll go under without a doubt. Hard times, hard times. Seems I'm being forced into a mold. Hard times, hard times. Forcing me and I'm growing cold. I'm not being forced into the mold. I'm there to break that fucking mold. You're not pigeonholing me into this bullshit that they're doing. All of this shit. Dirty line, everybody. No, fuck you. And then I get messages, oh, man, I really support you. Well, what the fucking do? Let me get you a fucking lollipop. How about you stand up too? How about you fucking take a stand against this bullshit? All these bands that sang against the system. There's no justice. There's just us. All the fucking shit. And you don't say nothing. And you don't say shit. Because you want to go out and sell your fucking $20 t-shirt and make a few grand at a show. I got a friend that stood up to the shit that signed a $100 million fucking deal with Spotify and put it on the line because he wanted to fucking speak up against what was going on. These guys won't even risk a $5,000 guarantee and $1,000 worth of merch that they want to sell. Don't fucking talk shit to me like I said. Stand up. Or shut the fuck up. And get out of the fucking way. Because you're going to get fucking rolled over. Bottom fucking line. That's punk rock. That's the shit I got into. When I heard the Sex Pistols. And I heard the Damn. And I heard the Ramones. And I hung out with the fucking Ramones in the 70s. That shit. That was life changing. And then meeting the Bad Brains. And then the hardcore scene. 
fucking 1980 on. Going to shows with fucking 10 people. I saw the Misfits, there was about fucking 20 people there at Chase Park. And it's still, the, I don't care. I, I walk a path solo. I don't care about group thing. I'm not getting in lockstep with nobody. I get in lockstep with motherfuckers that want to fucking lock arms and say fuck the system. That's my tribe now. My tribe is the people that fucking kicked addiction. That's my people now. I don't give a fuck about hardcore, punk, vegans, none of that bullshit. Because I just saw a lot of them don't even stand up for what the fuck they've been saying all these years. So I don't identify with that. So that's my rant. That's a good rant. Yeah, well, it's the truth. It's the truth. And, you know, like I said... What's your true character? What are you going to do under pressure? Now they're coming back with all the shit again. The lockdowns. They're telling you all this shit. You know, they knew, oh, there's going to be another pandemic. All the bullshit. And what are you going to do this time? I'm going to do the same shit I did last time. And that is live my life. Cheers to that. Well, listening to that, um, I'm very sorry for the passing of your brother, and I'm very sorry for you that you're left to process that and make sense of it, because that never goes away. So my condolences for that. Listening to you talk, you're definitely unlike anyone I've ever met before in my entire life. That's evident, and you're, I've been doing press for like, what? 10, 15 plus years, something like that. Um, I've definitely never interviewed anyone like you before. So I hope that you definitely are. I no, it's, I, hope, I hope that's in a good light. <laughs> no, no, it's great because you're, I've never seen passion like that before. And the things you talk about, they're more real than anything that we watch on TV and they're more real than any of the scripts and yeah, your well, book, <clears throat> your book that you're writing is going to help a lot of people and the things you've dealt with and the things that you're talking about, it doesn't get more real than that. And it doesn't get heavier than that. And just listening to you talk about it, um, it's, it's intense and it is real and, I'm sorry that, you know, you've had disappointments from people hey, I'm that, a, you know, uh, in your life too. Hey, you hey, know? hey, you know what? I learned this in life. There's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing and that's how they get away. I had people pretend in my band to be my best friend in the world and burn me and rip me off and, and fucking rat me out and all this other shit. And even in the Hare Krishna movement, when I joined, Right? I found out they were molesting kids and murdering people and doing all this shit. Like, they completely did everything against what Prabhupada said. And I spoke out against that. I'm like... And they tried to kill you for it. Yeah. Uh, they actually were gonna... They actually were gonna fucking kill me. The dude who I exposed for selling drugs and cocaine and running guns and all this shit... What, says, hey, you know, come down and work on these condominiums with me in, in Virginia, acting like everything was fucking cool. And, you know, so I was thinking, hey, all right. You know who told me not to go? Googie from the Misfits. Arthur, who was in, also in uh, Antidote. He goes, dude, you just did all this press exposing them. That guy had to resign. You exposed him for being a drug dealer and a rapist and all the rest of the shit. He's not biting you down there. They're going to fucking kill you. and He's going to shoot you in the fucking head and bury you in a fucking shallow grave in the woods. If you go down, you're not coming back. Artie saved my fucking life. Because I didn't go. I wouldn't be here doing this fucking interview today. A lot of situations... The higher power, Krishna, Shiradakshai Vishnu, the Lord in the heart, whatever you want to call it, gave me 
the clear sign not to do something. And if you do this, you're not coming back from it. There's always been, no matter all the asshole shit that I've done in my life, and I'm not innocent. Trust me, when you read this book on addiction, I take full responsibility for my fuck-ups. Full responsibility. I own it. I own my fuck-ups. There was always somebody watching out for me. There was always a guardian angel there looking out, guiding me, and eventually helping me to kick the shit. And, you know, the disappointments are always going to be there. That's the material world. You know what my teacher Prabhupada said? Prabhupada said, don't be surprised at the ones that go. Be surprised at the ones that stay. I didn't realize the depth of that statement until I've seen friends no longer be friends, do fucked up shit over money or anything like that, or drugs, or the government, or punk rockers, or hardcore people, or whatever. What? Hardcore don't mean you go to a show and you do your little fucking moves, and you have your fucking festivals, and it's all the show. Hardcore is a motherfucking mindset. Punk rock is a mindset. I've met more fucking punk rockers standing up against this government and what they've done in the last three years than I've ever met on the fucking scene. The little old lady down the road from me who grows her own organic vegetables and, and told the government to fuck off and supports no politicians is more punk rock and hardcore than half of the motherfuckers that's on the scene. You know, that's the way I see it. Because that is what determines who the fuck you are. What do you do when the pressure comes, like I said? And you're always going to, you know, you can't have high expectations of people. You have, you know, I, I, I still remain in a position of, of, okay, let somebody surprise me of like, okay, wow, hey, that person, that motherfucker stood up. Ah, oh, all right. But as far as like, Getting bent out of shape? I knew. I said, I said years ago, when I wrote the lyrics on that blood clot record, Burn Babylon Burn, Parallel Lives. I, I just I wrote the I wrote down the lyrics. We live outside the lines of parallel parallel lives. Uh we search for truth. We survive the crazy youth. Infiltrators exposed. When fools speak, we do what's right, stand up for the weak. Big Brother Takeover, all the shit I've been writing, where the fuck did you go, right? All that shit, all those lyrics for Blood Clot and all of it. Up in Arms, the record with Todd, now this new, rec new Blood Clot record, Souls, that... Strangely enough, Hardcore Punch called the distributor and the record label and told them not to put my record out. They tried to cancel it. And it was still number one in fucking Europe. It's yeah, that, and it's wild. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's wild. That's but I called it. I said, there's going to be an event and it's going to come and we're going to see it in our lifetime. And we're going to see who the real punk rock hardcore motherfuckers are. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, it, it is what it is, man. I'm just going to continue doing what I do. I'm recording new music uh, probably in the fall and see what happens for next year playing. Uh, I got a one man show coming. I got a book coming. I'm, I'm writing a punk rock comedy. We'll see what happens with that. Because, like, you know, fucking the whole way the film shit is going right now, they're all on strike. Because, you know, just like the music industry fucked over every musician, now they're trying to fuck over all the writers and the actors and everybody else. So who knows where, you know, AI and all this other shit, they, they're going to steal people's likenesses and fucking be able to, like, make movies without even, you know... 
Mm -hmm. all, all, all like the B actors and the actors that are background, they'll just steal their image and then put them and not even and, and pay them one yeah. time. And it's just like the streaming services, right? With the music. Nobody's getting paid right now. The record company's designed another way to fuck you over. They're streaming the movies now, too. So it's like, yeah. nobody's getting paid. The studios get paid. The studio heads get paid. The producers, the, the music label people, now they're taking... If you sign to a label now, they want part of your merchandising and your live gig money. They're fucking pimping you out. Yes. And, well, know, that's why it's going to come back to the roots of the whole shit. Who's doing it for the right reasons? Mm -hmm. I always did it for the right reasons. I didn't give a fuck about all that shit when you got those bands in the 90s. We're on salary and we got fucking tour bus. I'm like, you're going to learn a very, very powerful word in your life, young man and young lady. And it's called recoup. Because every motherfucking thing that that dude is spending money on, including like the hooker that he went out with and fucking paid for, you're going to repay it all. And that's why to this day, the Cro-Mags, I've never received one penny of royalties for Age of Qua. I don't even know how many of them motherfucking records got sold. I've never received a check. Did that let me stop playing music? Of course not. Because I love what I do. Just like my books. Just like writing the film. I've never sold a film yet. Now it's getting to the point where I'm just going to go make the motherfucker myself. I don't give a fuck. I'm in it for the art. I'm not in it for the fame and the prestige. The fame, adoration, distinction, the money. I love what I do. I love writing. I love waking up fucking pre-dawn. I love going to train for Ironmans. I love helping other people. Yeah. That's the whole package. That's what I do. So, and I'm never going to shut up. Like, like I'm going to speak out against the injustice that I see being done to innocent fucking people. That's what was the roots of punk rock, was standing up against the system. Look at all those records that came out back in the day. Everybody stood up. If they were doing in 19, man, you know, all 84 with the Reaganomics and all that shit, how the punks lashed out against all that shit and the way society was going. Fast forward, let's take all those punks with that punk mentality and bring it to 2023. There'd be fucking, there should be riots in the fucking street. Yeah. Riots in the street. Of what these motherfuckers are doing to humanity on this planet right now. Now the planet's going up in flames. But they're catching arsonists setting the fucking fires. All of this shit that just happened in Hawaii. I'm talking to people on the ground there. They turned the water off. The police blocked the roads. They let the grass dry. They turn off the water, but they keep the electricity power lines on next to dry grass. They didn't send any alarms out. They wanted that fucking property, Black Rock and all the rest of them. They burned. They allowed, allowed those fires to burn. There's no other explanation. And everybody that's there is telling me the same shit. They're killing people. And nobody's saying nothing. What I want. That's the passion is because I'm aware of what's going on. There's not a drug that enters my body. I'm, my mind is fucking clear. I'm seeing it all. And if you call yourself a punk rocker and you're not stupefied smoking 20 blunts a day, getting fucked up on alcohol and snorting coke, and you got any kind of clear perception, and you're actually a punk rock hardcore motherfucker, you're gonna start fucking saying something. I don't, you know, hopefully that happens soon, but, I mean, people didn't even change their lifestyles after 2020. 
Everybody went right back to the drugs, the drinking, the bad food. Yeah. Who knows, man? Some people touch the flame, get burnt, and they learn their lesson. Some people continuously touch the flame over and over and over again. I'm not that guy. I don't trust any politicians or any government or any corporation. They're all fucking full of shit. That's the message that punk rock came out with back in the day. And then hardcore. You know? Now you got the dead Kennedys who wrote all these lyrics against the government. Now you got Jello Biafra saying, If you don't get the thing, you should be in the morgue. And he wrote a song called Government Flu. And he tells people to turn people into the FBI. Yo. Like, am I living in a dystopian fucking, like, bizarro world from Seinfeld of what I'm seeing going on right now? So, your life was very hard on the streets in that entire time period. How did you get into music? Um, how did you find it? What was your life like? What made you pick up a microphone? When did you start I, writing I'm, lyrics? I'm going to tell you, like, you know, even, and I wrote about it in my book, you know, like, my mother, we like even with all the hell she was going through, she would put forty fives of Motown on, and we would dance around, and I would grab a broomstick and act like I was a singer. And then even in the foster home, no matter what I was going through, it was always music. I had a little AM transistor radio, and I would be under the covers in a filthy garage, like going through hell. But it was always the music that took me out of that, and I always knew, like. Somehow music would be a big part of my life. I had that passion for music. And then I, 74, 75, I heard fucking Higgy Pop, you know, the Stooges. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And then, you know, oh, going to see concerts, the, the fucking, you know, the, the Who, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, like all of that. It, it's music was always a big part of it. And I would always listen to the word. What are they saying? And then the punk explosion, 77, being out on the streets and going to fucking Max's and CB's and seeing the Ramones and, 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 you know, I lived in Rockaway Beach. I was, I went on the streets from the boys home there, St. John's home for boys, 76. Fucking going to the clubs, had a little punk rock, Girlfriend turned out to be a junkie, whatever, and, and, and she OD'd. But I'm saying, like, it was always the music. And then, you know, I got incarcerated and, like, you would go listen to your music somewhere and try to be alone away from everybody else. And then, you know, the Navy. I fucking had, like, the Sex Pistols destroy shirt you know like and 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 i was into the punk shit and then even before i seen the bad brains the teen idols and the untouchables came down and the whole dc posse came down to the taj mahal and they will they had just came back from the west coast so they were skanking and fucking slam dancing and i was still pogoing they fucking knocking me all over the club and diving off the stage I was like what the fuck is this man and I hung out with them and then I started going to shows in DC and then the Bad Brains came down a few months later and that was life changing yeah. and then everything happened what happened to me I, I, mean, I mean I was taking every drug under the sun except for heroin when I was in the military I sold the Bad Brains manager acid the night that I met the Bad Brains. But something resonated in me with what HR said. And when that case came, I split. Right before they was coming to get me to take me to the brig. Like, literally. And I went up to D.C. and I stayed at Henry Rollins and Ian McKay's place for like a week or so. Then they were like, all right, it's time to move on. I got went back to New York. I get out of the van. The Undead, Bobby Steele, who was in the 78 Misfits, formed a band called The Undead. They played the 930 Club. I saw the New York license plates. I'm like, yo, I need a ride. <laughs> they drove me up. 
and I got out the van and I ran into HR. And they were at, living at 171 Studio and they played a show and the Beastie Boys were there and I got in this fight with these with this Puerto Rican gang called the Hitman. I got I fucked them up. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I love this story. It's a great story. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. But then like the Yeah, God, I mean, tell that story. It's a great story about and, you know, people were, well, well, they came into the club, but the hitman had the big drug spot right there on 11th Street, right? It was the biggest cocaine heroin spot in the nation. The feds ended up shutting it down. So they didn't want anybody hanging out outside 171A, making noise. They had the lookout spot was the bodega on the corner, and then between A and B was their building, and that's where they had... People lining up for the dope spot opening, fucking enforcers walking down the street with baseball bats, getting lying, you know, crazy shit. You can't even, like, imagine what went down. So they came into the gig trying to end the gig, and I was, you know, I know everybody knows the, the band Gorilla Biscuits, but a Gorilla Biscuit is a quaalude, and they called it Gorilla Biscuits because you get gorilla shrimp and you want to fight everybody. The disco boys called them disco biscuits. I never, I sold in the 70s. My boys robbed a, a pharmaceutical warehouse. And we got the Mandrex pharmaceutical fucking quaaludes that came in these sheets. Like 50 pills in a sheet. And this motherfucker had boxes of them. I mean, I sold all that shit. But I was on a quaalude that night and drinking that the... So they came into the gig and started smacking punk rockers and pulling knives on people. Get the fuck out. They tried to end the show. So the Bad Brains are playing and the dude I got in the fight with, Crazy Eddie, tried, like, you know, goes like that. And I was like, I said, if you do that again, I'm going to fuck you up. Like, you know, and then he didn't, you know, Bad Brains are playing. So it's like craziness, chaos. So I went over to Jay Dubs, who was the producer that recorded the first Bad Brains Raw cassette. And they did it at that studio. And, and I said, yo, let's get these motherfuckers. Why ain't nobody fighting them? And Jay Dubs was like, yo, who was the first guitar player on Blood Clot? He goes, don't do nothing. Those guys are murderers. They kill people. They're a fucking drug gang. So then they basically ended the show. Everybody went out to the sidewalk. They're smacking people. Get the fuck out of here. Beastie Boys were there. So some people stayed in the... Were scared to go onto the streets and leave. They stayed in the, inside. And I'm sitting there with a 40, whatever, like a beer. And the dude comes up. He's like, yo, white boy. You, you know, you, you fucking hard of hearing, get the fuck out of here. And I was like, well, nah, you know, I heard you. I just don't give a fuck. So he slaps the beer out of my hand. And I was like, now nah, you owe me $3, you fucking piece of shit. Like, nobody's talking back to him. He tries, he pulls his knife out and tries to stick me in the fucking stomach. I blocked it. Bad bang, elbow, took him down to the ground, started pounding. Like, the look on his face when I cracked him. Because I boxed in lockup. I, I've been a street fighter my whole fucking life. I wasn't intimidated by these people. I grew up around black and Spanish people my whole life. But I knocked them out. And then, like, you hear, yo, white boy. And he, like, four or five motherfuckers come running at me, pulling out knives. And that back in the D.C. days, we used to wear the big bike chain with the quick release. That was my weapon. So I just started having a night fight in the middle of Avenue A. Fuck is, you know, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. And then uh, I lost the chain. And then I'm like dodging knives. I go to run back in the studio. I think it was Horowitz and Rock that tried to... Uh, Mike D or whatever tried to close the studio door and leave me outside. So I'm like halfway in, halfway out. And I'm like, yo, open the door. And that's when the motherfucker came up and said whack at my shoulder. But like, 
I cursed all of those motherfuckers out. I said, I'm standing up for you and not one of you motherfuckers helped me. So then I had to go out the alleyway window, but they put a they put a fucking hit out on me. They were nobody would hang out with me in the entire scene. Harley's mother was like, "Don't be damn, you're gonna get murdered." Because the hitmen they lived right by the hitmen. Nobody would hang out with me except for this crazy motherfucking street fighter Russian kickboxer dude named Contra. Who was the only non-Spanish motherfucker in the crazy homicides, which was a fucking Brooklyn gang. They let him in. That's how crazy this motherfucker was. And me and him hung out. And then I finally went up and faced them. And they were like, pulled out gats. Ready to take me off to the building. And Doc and Daryl ran out. We're like, yo, yo, yo. And they ended up squashing it. And the dude shook my hand and was like, out of all the punk rock motherfuckers, you're the only one that got heart. And then I became good friends with that dude, Eddie. As a matter of fact, when I did Rogan's podcast, I shouted them out. The hit, the hit man and the dudes on 11th Street. I was just there like last year. Before I moved down here and, and, and I ran into it, like, they seen my pit and they were like, yo, that's a dope dog. We start talking. I'm like, yeah, I, I remember, you know, JR on 7th Street with the dope spot that had bamboo and one eye, one eye tongue and bolo. And like, they're like, what? How the fuck you? You know, then we start talking. I go, yo, this was the hitman block. Dude turns around. He got a hitman ball cap on. He's like. I was the leader of the hitmen. And then we start talking. He's like, yo, man, you shouted us out on Rogan's podcast. And like, just became good friends, man. He just got out. He got shot up and fucking dude, like his whole stomach got removed. He's like, yeah, they got me in lockup. He was all fucking stitched up, walking with a limp. And he just did some crazy time. But yeah, you know, now it's like, you know, you got you had to make your bones on the street back then. That's what it was called. You didn't let motherfuckers walk on you. I'll tell you a funny story and then we'll end it with that. It's like a couple years ago, this motherfucker, right before I left, shit started getting crazy in the city with the thievery. So this like 20-something year old, you know, Spanish dude is like trying to steal my friend's bike tire my next door neighbor. And the guy goes to work on the bike. That, that's his transportation. He's not a rich. So I said, hey man, come on bro. Why are you violating? He's like, what? Tried to get all hard rock with me. I said, that's my friend's bike. And he's like, I'm not doing shit. So I go, all right, well I'm gonna stand here and make sure you don't do shit cause I'm not letting you take his fucking tire. He was, he was unscrewing the quick release, trying to steal the wheel. So then he gets up and he's like, yo, fuck you, white boy, all that shit, you know, I fuck you up. And I was like, you know, bro, if you put your hands on me, you, you, you're going to have a bad day. I'm just telling you that. Now. And then I kept my hands up at the ready, but he pulls out a with one motion, and it, it was his left hand, he pulls out a box razor, slides the blade open, and tries to come across my fucking face. It would have been the right side of my face. So I blocked it, and I came in, boom, elbow, bang, bang, kick, guy goes down, right in front of my building. So then he picks up a fucking piece of, there was all this construction shit on the sidewalk, they renovated the apartment. He tries to pick up a piece of plumbing pipe and fuck hit me with it. Blocked it. Bang. Pow. Pow. Fucking. Dude walks away and goes, I got something for you, motherfucker. I'll be right back. So I ring the bell. I'm like, yo, Bobby, come down, man. This dude tried to steal your fucking tire. Come get your bike. And then I hear, that's it right there. And I'm like, fuck. You know, now I got to run because, like, I'm not going to fight five of these dudes now. He's coming down the block with the cops <laughs> trying to get me arrested. And then 
the lady in the laundromat goes, no, no, he tried to stab my son. Because the lady came out and she's this old Bulgarian lady and she tells the kid, she goes, you better walk away. My son goes to gym every day. He's going to kill you. <laughs> she's telling him that. So then the cops come get up against the wall because he was fucked up. They was going to lock me up. And then I said, and then the woman said, no, no, he tried to slice him. And then the cops go, all right, both of you are getting locked up. And I go, put me in the fucking cell in the tombs with this motherfucker so I can finish the job. So then he was like, no, no, I don't want to press charges. I was like, well, I'm not pressing charges either and whatever. The cops were like, I said, he's been stealing all the bike parts off this block. Everybody's been getting their shit robbed. It's him. They go, call us if he comes back, we'll lock him up. I said, if he comes back, I'm going to put him in the fucking, I'm going to put him in fucking Bellevue. So they leave. Two months later, I see this old school head from the fucking hitman coming down the street that I know from back in the day with that kid. And he's like, yo, what's up, man? Like, fucking. And he goes, yo, man, me and this dude, we go way back, man. This was the one white boy that would fucking fight anybody and all this shit. I never said, like, and he, and, and he introduced me. He goes, this is my nephew. And I go, yo, how you doing, right? So the guy, the guy is the guy that I beat down. And he's like, you know, I didn't say nothing. I didn't blow up the spot. And, and as they're walking away, I go, leave them bikes alone. <laughs> and he's just like, but, you know, it's just that was part of the culture of the street. So when you get a lot of people singing lyrics now and they don't live it. So there's no there can't be no passion behind it. If you don't believe in what the fuck you're writing about and if you didn't live what you're writing about. You know, the audience is going to smell a lot. That's why when the cro came out. And not only did we have that street culture, we had that higher consciousness. We got to know malfunction. It's the limit. Street justice, hard times. It was like, that's why, that's why it was real. It was like, we were living the shit. At least a couple of us anyway. I mean, you know, Mackie lived uptown. Paris got rich parents that paid for everything. But like, you know, me and Harley lived in them squats, man. So like, the shit came, the shit came off real because it was real. It wasn't faking the funk like they say in hip hop. It was like, you know, when you go through all the shit, especially me as the front man and having to relay my experiences through song, the conviction is there. And HR was the first person. I was trying to be a drummer at 171. And he goes, you got too much energy to be behind a drum kit. And he was the first person to put that mic in my hand. And that's when the Cro-Mags first was, uh, the fir- Cro-Mags first rehearsals for six months was Dave Hahn, who was the Bad Brains manager, on drums, hold on, I'll show you right here, because this is the proof from the big takeover fucking fanzine. Romance, 1981, ended in August, rehearsed for months. Harley Flanagan on bass, Dave Stein on guitar, Dave Hahn, Bad Brains manager on drums, John Skinhead, that's what Jack Rabbit, who did the big takeover, called me. So all the shit about he's not the original singer. And read the article of why Dave Hahn quit what he said. Yeah. Why did the band end that? And he said, I'm not somebody's doormat that somebody in this band, and I can't say his name because I'll get sued, will disrespect and treat like shit. That's not me. But HR was that first person to put that mic in my hands. And then when the cro broke up, that same fall and winter, we formed Blood Clot and went out, I think it was November of 81, 
after the Cro-Max ended in August, and we formed as the Bad Brains Roadies. So we formed before then with uh, Papa Chubby Teddy um, being the bass player, but then we went on tour with this band called Crucial Truth on Down South, so we hired their bass player, uh, played bass with us, but it was me, J-Dubs, who did their sound, and then Alvin, who was the other roadie, was um, the drummer. And then we got the bass player from Crucial Truth, and that we did the whole Southern stuff and then came back up and played Irving Blaza, and there's a tape of us playing, and somebody yells out, from the crowd, you hear it, they go, tattoos are for jocks, because I was inked up, you know, so I was like, it's yeah. a different, it's a different time, it, 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 you know, and then, kept the blood clot thing going, we played with the Beastie Boys, I, I think it was at A7 or CB's or whatever, and then, I just went on to, to, I was supposed to go out on the road with the Bad Brains, and that didn't happen, and then, I, I just, 82, I just went, and, and I was a monk. I went I went to Hawaii, and uh, and then came back. And like I said, original singer and the best, because not to take anything away from Eric Casanova, because he wrote lyrics, and he, he so I saw Harley when um, I was out with the Krishnas, in 83, I came back to New York, early 83, and I was living in the temple. And I was going to the park and feeding people. And I did this big concert, uh, Rock Against Maya Means Illusion. And I put the concert together while I was a Hare Krishna. We fed 5,000 people. We got all these bands to play. And then I see Harley, and he goes, Yo, man, I'm putting the Chromex back together. You got to come back to the band. So why would he say I got to come back to the band? I, it's like the fact that I even have to say this shit like 40 fucking years later is ridiculous, but that's the lies that get told. And I was at the first two shows that Eric sang for the Crow Megs, if you want to call it that, because he sat on the drum riser most of the time and didn't even sing. Harley fucking kicked him. So after the second show, he was fired. And then... Harley wanted me back in the band, but Paris wanted Roger from Agnostic Front. So we had to audition. I was like, why do I got to audition? I, I'm in the band before this fucking guy, Paris, or whatever he called himself at the time, Kevin. And um, the rest is history. Harley said, just do what you do. And I well, went fucking killed the rehearsal, and that was it. I was back in the band, back as the singer. You know, and, and and that's, you know, and then started writing all, all them lyrics, man, you know, like that people, you know, and to get these people that are like, you know, you, you know, how can you play those songs? You're, you're stealing other people's music. I'm like, you don't know nothing about music and publishing because 50 percent of the publishing goes to the lyricist. I wrote those fucking lyrics on a majority of those songs. So I have every right to perform them. Dude out there now is singing my lyrics. I'm not crying on the internet about it. You're singing my words that I wrote. I don't cry about it. I don't, I don't care. Music's music. Any band wants to cover the cro Blood Clive, whatever, have at it. Yeah. So... I think maybe we have time to talk about one of them. I wanted to talk about, I've never talked to anyone from the Hare Krishna and I don't understand anything about it or know anything about it. So I kind of wanted to know just some general tenements of it and just the idea behind it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a process to develop love for Krishna, for God, everything about it. You live a life dedicated to spirituality, higher consciousness. You don't lose that warrior spirit that you have in life. You read the books, you chant, 
you do service for the Prabhupada brought it from India and he had disciples that were snakes they wanted to get this humble man came in his 70s to New York City with $7 and a case of books to help people he slept on the floor he cooked for everybody else before he took one grain of rice he went out into Tompkins Square Park and chanted congregationally with the with the hippies and the beatniks and all the people of the Lower East Side. He gave everything of his life to other people. And then the movement started growing and those same disciples started figuring out a way to get Prabhupada out of the way. And as Prabhupada aged in life in the 70s, they started poisoning him. They were giving him cadmium because they realized he was not going to allow them to be his successor. He didn't appoint any successors. You got guys that are having all kinds of sex and fucking drugs and doing crazy shit and stealing, and then they come to this movement and they get some knowledge and then they think they're better than Prabhupada. And that's what they did in the movement. But I came in 1980. Uh, after Prabhupada, they, they disobeyed everything that he said. But I, I was a real monk. Like I, I, you know, what Prabhupada gave to the world. If you research his teachings, and you know, he he translated. He's in the Guinness World Book of Records. He translated more of the Vedic, ancient Vedic books than anybody. So, for me, when I joined, it was real, you know? And I live by that. And that's that's another thing that I fight against to this day. As a matter of fact, the Big Spin article came out in the 90s. I mean, they, they molested and raped children and did, like, the most despicable things, just like all these other religions, like the Christian church. And that's the thing that got me, because when I started hearing that the kids were being molested... Nah, I'm getting these motherfuckers. I'm going to expose them. And it's a beautiful thing. And that's why, hey, to this day, I still chant. I still read Prabhupada's books. I wanted to ask about your daily routine because you said, I was listening, is it like 108? Like you chant for two hours or you did at some point or something like that? You know, the 16 syllables, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. There's 108 beads on the Japa Mala, so you do that on each bead, and then you that's 108 mantras, and then you do that 16 times throughout the day. You read, you do service for other people. Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti Yoga is about, the, it's the yoga of devotion. So you're, sir, you're helping other people, there's compassion. You know, so that's, I get up early before the sun and I meditate, I chant, I read the books, I write, I train, I, I do what I do. I moved to Florida now, you know, and, and it's for the training because like, hey, I live in a Hare Krishna community. I don't know what these knuckleheads are all talking about. All right, I have to go to Trump country. I live in Alachua. I'm in the Hare Krishna community, which I've been planning to move down to forever. And... You know, I trained in Ironman. Last year, I was able to ride outside the whole winter. It was 70 degrees out. I'm going to be growing organic food. We're putting raised bed gardens in and all this other shit on my friend's property over here. We're building a temple over here to help people, you know? Um, but everybody has to try to, like, find fault with something. And, you know, I, I got a house for, like, Half of what I was paying in rent, and I got a three-bedroom house here, brand new. My own office. Fucking my my wife, my girl has her office. It's like, we're living a good life, man. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of veterans in this subdivision, and, like, one of them is Bill. He's 80 years old, Vietnam veteran, did, like, crazy stuff. And he lost his wife for 50 years, and everybody just... Looks out for him and mows his lawn. We 
we went and took them food shopping to get healthy food. And, you know, I have to go over there later and put his seat covers on. Everybody, it's like a sense of community. White, black. Fucking everybody just getting along. Like, I, I don't know where they're getting this whole shit that this is like, you know, some brainwashed right wing fucking whole shit out here. It's not like that at all. You got rednecks in upstate New York. What the fuck are you talking about? Rednecks are everywhere. And there's black racists too. What about the five percenters? What about those guys that stand out on the street corner in New York City? That's the illness. And that's what Krishna consciousness solves all the world's problems. Because Prabhupada said, everything in this world comes from one thing. Identification of the gross material body. We don't see that we're spirit soul. Aham Brahmasmi is the first teaching of spiritual life. That I'm not the body. I'm the spirit soul. So that ends all of it. All of it is God. Your fucking racism. I lived in a temple with everybody from all over the world. We never had one single racial incident. Because we didn't vibrate and identify on the material platform. There was no sexism against women. If you're living the, the path the right way. Because it's respect. We address the women as mataji. Which means mother. We looked at every woman with utmost respect. And God help you if you ever tried to put your hands on one of those women or one of those children on our watch. You're going to get the fucking karma. But all of this, like, I identify as this and that and all this fucking insanity that's coming now, it's all Maya. Because the minute you say I'm not the body, it's all out the fucking window. I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. The spirit soul has none of those identifications. It's a spirit soul. And when you actively live your life on that platform, all of the nonsense goes away. All of it. That is the peace formula that Prabhupada talks about in his book, The Science of Self-Realization. What's the peace formula? Everybody identify as a spirit soul, right? See, everything on this planet does not belong to us. It was here before us. It's going to be here after us. Let's use it in the service of Krishna and humanity to make everyone's life better and improve the planet. The Brahminical standard is you leave something better than how you found it. That's what it's all about. And everything, sustainable organic farming, everything that Prabhupada set up is the ultimate solution to every fucking problem. And the thing about it is that Prabhupada came now and said the stuff that he said, I don't care what your beliefs are. Like Prabhupada said, this is from a, a, a self-realized soul, that if we stop the murdering of unborn children and we stop killing billions of animals, there would be peace on the planet. I don't care what you believe. You know, you could do whatever you want in this world. You go do whatever you want. You have a right to choose to do whatever you want. You also have the right to add to the karmic load of the planet. And you know what? If everybody followed the Gabadam Samskara and followed the principles, there would be no unwanted progeny. It wouldn't happen. So that's the solution for that. There wouldn't be no animal slaughter. There would be... There would be organic, sustainable farming. No pesticides. All of this. Prabhupada talked against the pesticides. Prabhupada spoke in front of the World Economic, the World Health Organization, and called them a bunch of fucking demons. He didn't curse, but he said, you people are demoniac. All you want to do is give people drugs. So everything that Prabhupada gave in his books and he said, my books will be the guideline for humanity for the next 10,000 years. There's a golden age. That's where I got the name Age of Quarrel. It's from Prabhupada's teachings. Age of Quarrel means Kali Yuga, the Iron Age of Quarrel and Hypocrisy. I named that album from Prabhupada's teachings. 
So when an idiot in the band goes, I wonder what would have happened if Roger would have got the gig. It wouldn't have been the Cro-Mags. It wouldn't have been no Age of Quarrel. That, those lyrics came from Prabhupada's books. So everything that Prabhupada said was the absolute truth. And within this Kali Yuga of 427,000 years, there is a period of awakening of 10,000 years. And that's where we are 500 plus years into that. It's always the darkest before the dawn. And everything that I might have said, someone could misconstrue it and say, hey, that's negative. It's not. It's always the darkest before the dawn. These people that are doing everything to humanity, their days are numbered. No time in history did evil prevail. They may have controlled for a while and then they were dealt with. It's going to be the same thing happening to these people now because the truth is going to come out and people are going to come together and people are going to live lives in higher consciousness. Prabhupada said simple living and high thinking. That's what life's about. You know, the consciousness awakening of the masses, it's happening. It's happening because these circumstances are forcing people to question and, 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 and get awake. And they use the term woke. Woke is, woke to me don't mean you follow a bunch of stupid fucking politicians and what they say. Woke to me means awake. I am now seeing everything clearly with real perception. I know who I am spiritually. I act on that platform every day. And that's what Krishna consciousness is about. Hare Krishna means, oh Lord, oh energy of the Lord, please engage me in your devotional service. I address everybody as Prabhu. That means master. That means I'm here to serve you. Everything about the six shikshastika, trinata pisunechana, tarawi voshishana, mani damanani yata kadani das, kirtani yasadahari. That you should think of yourself lower than the straw in the street, devoid of all sense of false prestige, more tolerant than a tree. In that humble state of consciousness, one can constantly vibrate the Hare Krishna, holy names of the Lord. And that goes for any process. So that's what the whole movement is about. And that's why they took it down. Because the most intelligent class of society was joining the movement. And the movement was infiltrated by the CIA. That's a fact. And then they put their puppets in there to poison Prabhupada and, and steal money and power grabs and all this stuff. Yeah. It's crazy because they were taking notice. It was the fastest growing spiritual religious practice, whatever you want to call it, in the United States. The scholars of all the universities were joining the movement. When you read the Vedas, it's science. Veda means knowledge. It's not some like, duh, thou shalt not steal, duh. But how about we get to the real science of God consciousness and the and humanity and the creation and everything? The Vedas, the Vedas include everything, even medicine, the Ayurveda. Look at it. Now they're using turmeric and all this stuff. I mean, ginger. That's all from the Ayurveda. So it's the complete system of everything. So that's why I follow it, uh, you know, to this day. And if everybody could just do a little bit of what Prabhupada taught, the world would be a much better place. But even Prabhupada said, there's 12 or 13 families that control the entire planet. Imagine that. Imagine that, that Prabhupada would say that. And Prabhupada also said, when he first came, if they knew what I came here to do, they would kill me. Well, they did find out, and they did try to kill him. And because the real revolution 
is not trying to make the prison a nice place. The real revolution is to get out of the prison. I was locked up. Every day I thought about getting out. So that's the real thing. You can have your politics. You can have your materialistic murdering society. We don't want anything to do with that. We're going to create a society based on love, compassion, understanding, unity of all people. That's why when you see our Christians, it's from every, you see people from every walk of life. Nobody's like, blacks are not allowed. You know, honky, calling people whatever. Oh, you know, she's a lesbian. Nobody cares. But when you come to those doors of the temple, you leave behind all of those material bodily designations. And Prabhupada said, Maya doesn't come through the front door, it enters through the heart of the devotee. So stay on guard. I wrote a whole chapter in this book on addiction called The Razor's Edge, because that's what life is. One slip can be fatal. Well, my favorite thing that you said is that our body is our super shell. That was my yeah, favorite thing that is. that I like this that. Is the is it good? Yeah. yeah. This is so the we're sorry. That's carrying us through this life. So we respect it. That was the quote today from Prabhupada. I read these every day. We should not eat more than required. Eating, sleeping, mating, all these are material demands. The more we minimize, then that is good, but not at the risk of health. Because we have to work for Krishna, we must maintain our health nicely. Prabhupada said that August 23rd, 1968. So I don't take drugs. I don't take poisonous foods in. I don't take alcohol in. I exercise. I keep my mind right. I use, we should see that we're instruments to do God's work. And all of these people like, to me, the people that are into God are the real punk rockers now. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it used to be like, oh, that's corny. You believe in God? Yeah. But you talk to people that have faith on any path and they've been through fucking hell and back. That's what brought us to the path of faith. Don't talk to me unless you've been tested and then we'll see who you are. Because you couldn't even maintain... Hardcore punkism. So I, I've noticed that the people who have the faith have been tested the most in life. And God saved us from what the fuck was happening in our lives. It was a higher power stepped in and helped us. And there was one atheist, he wrote all these books on atheism. And he got kidnapped for money and put in the trunk of a car. And when the police finally caught his captors, he came out and said, burn every book I ever wrote. Because every day I was in that trunk, in that dark space, I prayed to God to get me out of that situation. And when I was locked up and all this shit happened to me as a kid, and the fucking being molested and fucking the streets and the drugs and getting shot and fucking dr like my girls died, all the shit I've been through, when I was in Spofford and I was locked in that, I, you know, you got to walk around in the yard and be like, you know, I put a chair across the first motherfucker that fucked with me. They, they nicknamed me Mighty Whitey in Spofford. I was the only white kid there. But when I got locked in that cell at night, the tears came and I prayed to God, why, the, why am I having to be put through all of this? Where, what's going to happen in my life now? Where am I going? And God answered that in the years to come and directed me on the path. That breadcrumb trail led me to where I was at, led me to Prabhupada, led me to the bad brains. The bad brains is what got me into spirituality. They got me a job at the health food store. Me and HR, the whole time they did raw cassette, we would meditate and fucking run and 
and go to the park at sunrise after recording and he'd be reading me the lyrics that he was writing for the fucking songs and seeing there the energy. It changed my fucking life. That's why I got the passion I do today. I was in it for real. My whole fucking heart and soul went into this movement. That's why I get fucking pissed off when they try to destroy it and turn everybody against each other. And the guys that spoke up are the bad guys now. Well, you're, you're a fucking right-wing conspiracy theorist. Fuck you. That's why I get pissed off. I gave my life to this shit. 43 fucking years now. Always helping people. Somebody needed a benefit. There I was. Whatever the fuck it takes to help people. When I made my money, I built a yoga center that fed the homeless on St. Mark's. And I did all the construction myself. With other people and my friends. And maintained it for 10 years. I gave $400,000 of my money. I put my money where my fucking mouth is. I raised $100,000 for a kid with cancer. I've done countless benefits. And everybody in the hardcore scene donated to that too and helped out. And then to see all this shit go down and they have to destroy the movement. Like they destroyed the Hare Krishna movement. I just hope people start paying attention. And start coming together, man, against the real enemy. Fuck all these politics. Politics ain't gonna solve nothing. Politics don't solve nothing. It's ring wrestling. It's the WWE. Yeah, you got the right wing, you got the left wing. It's both the same bird. They're laughing, having drinks together. Look at Obama hanging out with Bush, a murderer. Obama and, and Obama too drop more fucking bombs on anybody, on children and women than any president in history. That motherfucker dropped so many bombs the Air Force ran out of bombs. And everybody gave him a pass. It's our guy. He plays basketball. He's a bro. Fuck that. You don't get in that office. Trump too. All the right wings. Rallying behind them. It's all to divide the people. If they keep the people divided, they stay in power. If the kids are united, we will never be divided. Remember all the lyrics everybody's been chanting at concerts. I say, pay attention to the malfunction. I just can't get through to you no matter what I say or anything I do. It seems I'm fucking talking to a wall. That's why I'm so passionate about the shit. You came after the shit that I gave my life to. I get, and, and, and Hare Krishna too. That's why I've been fighting with these devotees. They killed people in the Krishna movement that spoke out against these bogus people that are doing all this shit. They murdered them. They stole billions of dollars now. And there's a group of devotees that have been fighting them and speaking the truth. And they came to get them. So then I stepped in with all my friends. Who are way better fighters than any of these fake tough guys in the Hare Krishna movement. And we stopped all that shit. You don't, t you don't put your hands on nobody. And it's the same with the hardcore. So when you think that a few words or whatever you're going to say against me. After everything I've been through. You want to cancel me? I had motherfuckers try to cancel me in real life. I had people try to murder me on the streets, in lockup. You think words? You're over there with your fucking keyboard commando shit? Saying shit? That don't fucking bother me. I'm going to still speak the truth. And I'm going to speak the truth about Hare Krishna, about hardcore, about what the government's doing, all of it. That's what I do. That's what I've always done. I'm like, it's common sense, man. Instead of going off the rails, sit back and analyze things, man. Meditate. That's what I do every morning. I get up 
and I meditate and I chant and I read philosophy and that's what life has to be about. And then I look, who can I help today? Who every 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 message that somebody sends me, man, I'm I'm going through. I just got one yesterday. I'm fucking struggling, bro. I got seven days clean. I fucking sat there fucking 20 minutes on the phone with him. I don't know him. But that's what it's about. And that's what I'm always gonna be about. So, you know. I don't care, you know. Anybody can say whatever they want. My track record speaks for itself. 